get started and get into things, I want to remind everyone that we do have a staff nursery available and also children's church is going on. And if you have children that would like to attend, there will be a greeter or an usher uh, in the entry, in the foyer, or in the back of the building that can give you directions to where to take your children. Amen? Amen. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning as we begin our service. As, as I was praying, you know, I, I was in prayer this morning about this, this day. Because I believe God wants to do something. And as I was in prayer, this is what the Lord laid upon my heart. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 says, If you then are risen with Christ. Anybody here risen with Christ? It says, seek those things which are above. Amen. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things that are on this earth. A lot of things going on on the earth. Let's get our minds off of all that as we enter in this morning. Amen? Because you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There's an old chorus that we used to sing that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Can we just set aside everything, all distractions, and let's worship Jesus this morning. Join me this morning as we pray. Father, we love you and praise you. We are so thankful and so grateful to be in your house this morning. And as we enter in today, God, we invite you. Help us this morning to set aside all the distractions and everything, Lord, that would hinder us from focusing on you. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to come into this place and have your perfect way in this service. And we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in this house today, isn't it? I said it's good to be in this house today, isn't it? Amen. That's better. Amen. It is. Amen. As he's talking about the things that's happening around us, you know, the, the antidote to that is just to praise the Lord. It's just to worship him, just to sing praises to him, just to shout out to him. And whether it's with a shout of praise or whether it's a whisper in a small, small time, small voice to him as we are worshiping to him. You know, whatever it may be that's going on personally in your life, we see what's happening in the world because all you have to do is look around you. But sometimes there's just things individually that's happening with us in the world. Then what we need to do is just begin to raise a hallelujah, just begin to sing to sing to the Lord and begin to exalt Him for who He is. Amen. He doesn't change. The Bible tells us He doesn't change. And so we know He doesn't change. It doesn't matter what's changing around the world. It doesn't matter what's changing around in our lives, but he does not change. It doesn't matter what the report is, Brother John. God does not change in Jesus' name. He is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word does not lie. He does not lie. And so this morning, we're just going to sing out to him. We're going to sing with the voice of victory. We're going to sing with a shout of praise today. And I invite you to worship along with us. I invite you to raise your own hallelujah. I can't sing your hallelujah. I can't sing your praise. It's up to me to sing my own praise. And that's what the Lord wants us to do is each one of us as individuals is to worship the Lord in this house today.
praise to the holy faithful one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise your name. of all, it's up to you and I, as Sister Hunt said, to raise our own hallelujah. No matter what you're going through this morning, if you will rise above that situation and begin to raise a hallelujah and begin to bring praise to the Lord, as I said at the beginning, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. And then... There is freedom. Come on. We, we talk about living in America and being in a free country and having liberty, but I want to take it a little deeper than that this morning. I want to take it deeper. I want to take it into Christ. Amen? Because our freedom and our liberty in Christ is so much more and so much deeper than any of the other freedoms that we might have. Amen? And if we could just get a hold of that in our personal lives and allow Christ, after all, doesn't the word say, he who the son's son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. There's a lot going on in the world, but we're free. Amen? We have liberty in Christ, and where the Spirit is, or the Lord is, there is liberty. And I don't know about you, but I feel it this morning. Amen? Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. You know, without, without talking about everything, we know, everybody knows what's going on in the world, Okay? I want to bring it right down here, personal this morning, to you and to your life. And if you have a need this morning, just lift your hand. Just lift your hand. Come on, look around. Look around. Personal needs in this building. Well, I know a personal God. I know a God. The Word says that before you ever even begin to verbalize, Before you ever take it from here or here and bring it out here, are you listening? The Word of God says He already knows what you're about to say, but He still wants you to verbalize it because He's a God who created us for relationship, and He wants to hear us talk to Him. And he wants to talk back. Amen. So we're going to talk to him this morning in prayer. And as we ask, the Bible says if you believe, when you ask in faith, the word of God says he will do whatever you ask. Come on. We believe in liberty in Christ. We believe we're free. Then we've got to believe that when we ask him in faith, that he is going to answer our prayers. Amen. 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 
Now more than ever, it is a time when the church is being called to walk by faith yes, yes. and not by sight. Amen? Amen? Would you join together with me as we pray? Father God, we love you. We are so thankful, God, for the promises in your word. The promises, God, that over and over and over again tell us so many things, God, that we can ask and you will do those things. Promises, Lord, that nothing shall be impossible with you. That all we have to do is ask in faith, believing when we ask, and you will do it. That, God, that by the stripes that Jesus bore on his back by those stripes our healing was bought long ago and paid for and we thank you for that this morning Father for every need this morning whatever it might be your word addresses every single need that we might have in our lives financial emotional spiritual whatever it is God and we ask you to meet these needs for our, these people, for each and every one that is here. God, in an intimate way, let them know that you are more real now. You are more so real in their lives, God. And we thank you, Lord. Bless our people. Bless the people this morning. And bless our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the Lord another big hand of praise. Amen. Amen. And you, you may be seated this morning. Amen. If you can, I'm not sure that I could go and just sit down right now because I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. We welcome you to the house of God, and we welcome each and every one that that is tuning in online with us. Amen. Not everybody can be here at this present time, and we understand that, but aren't you glad for technology? Aren't you thankful? Amen. And, you know, this service is going to be so good this morning that when they post it, you're going to want to watch it again. Come on. Amen. I've done that. I watched it again because it's been that good. So we welcome each and every one of you today. If you're a first-time guest with us this morning, we are so grateful to have you with us. It's good to have you. And there is a card called a connection card in the back of the pew that is there in front of you. If you've never filled one out, if it's your first time, or you've never filled one out so we can get to know you, do that for us. There are boxes on the wall on each side of the sanctuary in the back. You can drop it in there uh, at the end of service, and we'll be in touch with you, but we're thankful to have you here in our service. And now, guess what? You're our friends. Amen? And if you're looking for a church, I personally know a great one. Amen? Amen. Otherwise, I wouldn't have stayed here for 30-something years if it wasn't a good church. Amen? So God bless you. We welcome you. Let's let our first-time friends know they're welcome this morning. Amen. Now give our pastor a big hand. He's going to come and address our offering this morning. Praise God. Amen. It is so good to be here in the house of the Lord. Would you give me some house lights, gentlemen? Appreciate that. But it's good to be here today. It's good to worship uh, the Lord with you in this place on Father's Day. Amen. And uh, we appreciate all of our dads. It's a privilege to be a father. And uh, we're going to certainly honor them. Lenore will be up here in just a few moments, but we appreciate you. Uh, I I didn't step forward to do this, but I'm going to do it. And that's what happens when you get the mic. You kind of get to do whatever you want to do if you're the pastor. Yeah. I better throw that in. Amen. But, uh, I, uh, I know there's some folks among us that are, are battling sickness in their body, and I'm not going to point all them out. They'll be at liberty to tell you what's happening. 
Uh, but I just know there's a lot of people here today that you are battling sickness, you are battling disease. We've got people that aren't here today that are sick. And I was reading, a, I, well, a scripture rolled through my mind, and then I pulled it up in, in the book of James, chapter 5, and verse number 15. And I don't know about you, but I, 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 I 100% believe the Bible. I do. I 100% believe what the Bible says. I've, I've never been a person to take and pick apart the Bible and you know, this sounds good. I can live, live this way. I'll, I'll believe this, but I'm not going to believe that other stuff. I've really tried to live according to the Word of God, and that's the way I've been taught. That's the way my pastor taught me as I came up as a young man. But I believe 100% of what it says. And I believe what it says about prayer and what it says about faith. And I was looking in James chapter 5, 15, and the Bible says, in the prayer of faith. Not just a prayer, but a prayer of faith. Faith, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, be thou removed, and it will be cast into the sea. So, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. Now, a lot of times we just apply that to the physical healing that can take place through the prayer of faith. But it says, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So he shall save the sick, he shall raise him up, and if he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Let me show you, the prayer of faith is powerful. But I want you to hear me today. If you're sick in your body today, I believe, and this isn't the only scripture, but I believe the word of God. And I believe that Jesus Christ was willingly tied to a whipping post and took 39 stripes on his back. It was a horrible event. The movie, even though we watched The Passion of Christ, and it was, oh man, it was vivid. Probably couldn't even depict what really happened that day. But each one of those stripes were taken for our healing. So if I get sick in my body, the Lord took a stripe to heal that disease. And I want to believe with you today, and I, I just had to stop and pray. I know Jeff's already prayed, but I just felt like we needed to pray the prayer of faith right now for healing in bodies. Would you do that with me? Dear God, you know every person under the sound of my voice today that needs a healing in their body, in their mind, in their spirit, in their emotions. You know everybody that needs a healing, and I know that you're able to touch them. And God, together with my brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray the prayer of faith right now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. But I pray, God, their healing to come in Jesus' name. Father, I bind heart disease. I bind lung disease. I bind cancer. God, I bind any other problem, Lord, that is happening in the body right now. Lord, we just pray for healing in the name of Jesus. And God, that you would meet the need right now. Father, we thank you. God, I just, I, I feel it, Lord. I, I feel like the prayer, I feel like a, a level of faith has risen in this house today and that lives are being touched and bodies are being healed. And we just believe it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand of praise today. I believe God for that touch and I believe God for that healing today. I asked Jeff to let me come forward today and just address the offering. The first thing I want to tell you is thank you for your giving. And we have multiple ways to give here at the church. You can text to give. You can give online. We have an app that you can download. Uh, and then there are offering boxes on both of the back walls on each side and then out by the information desk. You can drop your tithe in there. Uh, we've always received our offering, uh, but... Uh, going through the COVID, trying to not to transmit as much as possible. 
uh, we uh, went this direction, and it's working well. So uh, we, we appreciate uh, your giving and your faithfulness. But the reason I wanted to address you is because if you have not heard, uh, due to the COVID-19, our summer camps were canceled. And uh, they just felt like there were too many restrictions that they had to abide by. They could only house a portion of the kids at each camp. It was going to make it extremely difficult. So I remember being a teenager. You go, how can you remember back that far? Amen. I, I pray the fleas of a thousand camels in your bed tonight. Amen. But I can remember back that far and how important camp was. In fact, I looked forward to camp the whole year. And I, you know what, as a teenager, there have been plenty of times I probably live like the devil between camps. That doesn't give you permission to do it just because I did it. But I had my problems as a teenager, but I can tell you, I knew when I went to camp, I was going to be in the altars every night. And I knew God was going to do something transforming in my life. So this is a big miss for them. I think about our kids that are juniors and seniors, that it might be the last time that they get to go. They're not going to be able to do that. So we are going to do something here at our church, and we are going to have a three-day camp for our teens and a two-day camp for our juniors. Day camp means you get them at night. Do you understand what we're saying there? Amen. And uh, we know that that will certainly cut down on any possible uh, transmission, and we're going to do all we can. But we're our young people are going to have a great time, and we're going to make that happen. Our youth pastor and his wife are heading that up and his staff. And uh, the only thing we want to do is we want to make it as special as possible. And every year we come to you for camp sponsorships. And our church is just absolutely amazing when it comes to camp sponsorships. Uh, and we have envelopes in the pews, but I'm asking you to help us sponsor Depending on the amount of money we get in, it depends on what all we can do and, and what all we can bring in. So if you can help us with this, if you were going to send a kid to camp, you were going to pay $125, $150 a kid, give something to this event. If you normally sponsor camp, would you help us out? Would you, would you put a check in here? Would you go online and note it that it's for our youth camp? And uh, we want to make this a great time for them. Let me tell you, it's not going to be all play. They're going to play some. But they're going to have great services every night, powerful, Holy Ghost-filled services where their lives can be touched and transformed. So, amen. And the same way with our juniors, so we're going to have a great time. But, but let's make this happen. Will you do that? So as you give, be mindful of that. Grab one of these envelopes. Even if you don't have it to give today and you want to give later, grab an envelope. They're in the pews. We'll pick them up after the service and replace them next week. But I think that's a good thing. How about you? And so let's do that. Let's, let's have a great camp. And I'm sure as it gets closer, we'll let you know. But there may be some type of registration just so we'll know on how many's coming and uh, not get blindsided. That can happen. I remember, uh, in fact, I ran into Greg and Brandy Harvey, our, our youth pastors, from years ago yesterday in a parking lot in Kingwood. And, uh, by the way, they just took a church in Brazoria, Texas. They're moving back down to Texas, and we're excited to have them back down. But I remember they went to Astro World one time, and they had 35 kids sign up. And they got here, and they had 63 kids. And uh, that presents a problem. They were calling, scrambling, getting rides. They got them all there and uh, had a great day and enjoyed it. But, uh, you know, uh, we need to know, so we'll, we'll put something in order there so we have an idea of what we're looking at. But amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. For the opportunity to give and to bless. Amen. And I'm going to invite my beautiful wife to come today. Amen. Amen. It is great to have each one of you here today. It is a blessing to be here. Uh, we do want to honor our fathers. It's so happy Father's Day to each one of you. Um, if you're a dad here today or a father here today, would you mind just joining us by standing today so that we can acknowledge you? Yeah. Do you have to? I saw somebody look at their wife to decide if they were a father or not. Yes, you are. I won't, I won't call you out, Frank. <laughs> Give them a good hand clap. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. You may be seated now. You know, many of us, I, I am just so blessed to have my dad here. I have my dad here. I have my brother here. I have my son here. And I have my husband here. Those are some amazing 
um, dads in my life. I also have a nephew behind me that's here. You know, I have had some amazing men in my life that um, are some great dads. Not only do I have family members that are great fathers, but I have some spiritual um, men in our life that have been great dads too. And I just want to encourage you, some of you have not had the privilege um, either in your life as you were growing up um, to have that spiritual or have to have a great dad. And I just want to tell you, don't let that be a deterrent for you. Um, sometimes if you don't grasp hold of someone in your life to be a good mentor, it, it hinders your relationship with your heavenly father. And I want to tell you that there are a lot of, of good men in life um, that can be a spiritual father for you. I know my dad has, pastor refers to him many times as being his spiritual dad. And he has been. He's been was his, his only pastor previous to uh, my father going to um, go be our bishop. And then he had a, another pastor that was his spiritual dad for a short period of time. But it is an honor to have each one of our dads here. And if you're watching online and not able to be with us in our service, we say Happy Father's Day to you as well. It is our pleasure and our privilege that you would partake of our service today. And we trust that not only during the service today do you feel the importance of God's love in your life, but that also that when you leave from the service today, that you will um, feel just a great service and that somebody will make you feel real special today. You know, I was thinking as how we would honor because we're having to honor a little bit different. But I was thinking about a scripture, which is kind of a, a, a little different scripture for that. You know, our family has, um, when I say this, some of you are going to laugh. I thought, they're going to think. Um, our family has um, a sense of smell. Uh, and so we, that's one of the things about our family. I said all families do. But um, so we have a sensory thing. And I'm not good. When we went to Drew, to, I'm not looking at you for other senses, Drew. But, uh, but when we went to Cabo, Every time we would go, we took Drew to Cabo for when he graduated from high school for his graduation gift. Every time we walked into a certain the hotel we were staying at, it just had this wonderful smell. And just as soon as you walked into the lobby, and it was just like, what is that? It smells so good. Well, for about twelve bucks, you could have that sense of smell we take home with you. And so. I bought a can for me, I bought a can for Drew, and so I spray it and spritz it in my house, and it just takes us back to Cabo, you know, that just that sense of smell. I was laughing, I thought the other day how strange this guy probably thought my son was, because he was telling me this story about he was somewhere the last weekend, and he smelled this guy's cologne, and he, he, he walks up to a stranger and says, man, I really like your cologne, what is that? And so the guy tells him what the cologne is. Well, I know I've been guilty of walking up to women and doing the same thing. They probably think, who is this? But, um, you know, I want to ask you today, and be careful, don't answer out loud, please. What fragrance are you smelling and what fragrance are you giving out? And this is important to us, especially dads, because the fragrance that you are sharing with your family and this applies to our, our moms as well. The scripture in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15 says, But thanks to be to God, for through what Christ has done, he has triumphed o- over us that now wherever we go, he uses us to tell others about the Lord and to spread the gospel like a sweet perfume. As far as God is concerned, there is a sweet, wholesome fragrance in our lives. It is the fragrance of Christ within us and an aroma to both the saved and the unsaved all around us. So dads, what fragrance are you sharing as an example and giving off to your family? Not just in church, but at home. Now moms, that applies to us too. But if you're not a dad or a mom, then let me ask you this. What fragrance are you sharing with the people in your job? Because if you truly have accepted the Lord as your Savior, 
you confess that to others that you have anyway. What fragrance are you sharing? Is it a sweet aroma? Is it that of a perfume? Would others say to you, hmm, what perfume are you wearing? What is that smell? God bless you, and it's wonderful to have you with us today. Miss Janet? Would you stand as we enter back into worship this morning? So thankful for the Lord. So thankful that we can cry, Abba Father, which is a very personal term for Daddy. How intimate our God is. I love you. Oh, you bursting never fails me.
worship you, Lord. Amen. God, just have your way. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way today, God. Lord, we praise you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord. Feel your presence, God. We honor you today, Lord. We just bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you for your presence.
Would you lift your voices and your hearts to the Lord right now? Lord, we just love you. More than anything, God, we want to be in your presence. We want to worship and, 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 not, and not be about us at all. But, Lord, it be about you. Father God, thank you for your power today, your presence and your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. If you can be seated, please be seated today. Again, it is just an honor to have you in the house of the Lord with us, and we appreciate all of our dads uh, that are here uh, with us today. Real men serve God. Real men love Jesus. I believe that, and uh, I am uh, just uh, very thankful Uh, for each of you, and there are so many more that aren't here today. I know people are out uh, with their families, things like that, but uh, there there are so many more dads, a part of our congregation that we do love and we do appreciate. Amen. I want to remind you, I'm about to go in the Word, but uh, Sister Pamela Barrick's service is this Tuesday at uh, 2 o'clock here at the service. Please pray, continue to pray for the Barrick's family and the Ashcraft family. Uh, they've suffered a, a couple pretty tough losses uh, within a short period of time, and we want to pray for them. David, it's good to see you this morning, man. I'm praying for you. And know that God is going to be with them. Amen? I believe that. Hallelujah. I want you to turn with me in your word today to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and just kind of hold it there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'll be there uh, in a few moments. And uh, I promise you, I'll, I know I'm getting the pulpit maybe a little later than I normally do, but We'll wind it down around 1 or 2, somewhere in there, Uh, 1 or 2 till noon maybe. How about that? Somewhere in there. Praise God. But it's good to see you. Welcome to our guests and our friends that are here with us today. I I do miss my father. My father has been passed away a couple of years now. In fact, uh, right around the time that Hurricane Harvey hit, my dad died and uh, actually had to delay his funeral in order to get there, but uh, I do miss him. My father was a good man. He was not an educated man. I think he probably went through maybe the seventh grade, and uh, then he was in life working and had a a real hard uh, life coming up with with a mother that died when I think he was nine. His father committed suicide when he was 11 and left all of uh, the children, and there were a lot of them, uh, for his oldest sister to raise, and so uh, dad had a difficult life, but dad was a good man. He was a hard worker. He believed in working working hard. Uh, he didn't make a lot of money through life, I can tell you that. When, when my mom and dad died, they didn't leave me anything. No, they did. I'm sorry. We, we paid the funeral costs, so we took care of that, but that was an honor, amen? But I'm telling you, they didn't leave, leave us anything. Uh, but my, my father was a hard worker all of his life, and I do miss him. 
even though he was in a, a convalescent home for the last several years of his life, every time I went to Carolina, I visited with him. And uh, he, you know, I just miss even getting to do that, even though I don't have to see him in that condition anymore. It's just something about having him here. So, so I miss, miss my father and uh, had some good times growing up. He taught me to do some things like every dad does. My dad was a painter, a painting contractor, and he wanted me to be a painter. And so guess what I did when I was very young? I started going with him to paint. And he had a paintbrush in my hand from about five or six years old. And uh, so I learned to paint, and I, I really don't like him for teaching me how to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just one of those things, and I certainly learned how to do it and could have did it uh, my entire life if I wanted to, but I'm glad God called me to be a preacher. Amen. Amen. I'm, you, you don't even know how thankful I am that God called me to be a preacher for a lot of reasons, but number one, I'm not a painter, and all three of my brothers are plumbers, so I probably would have been a painter or a plumber. Amen. And I am so thankful that... Uh, God called me into the ministry, but I appreciate my father. I miss him. If your dad is gone, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, You miss your father, and and if you had a good dad, nobody replaces them in your life. You know what I found out? After you get older, you start acting like them a little bit. Honest, my wife lives with me. She knows that. And, And you start looking like them a little bit more, and and things begin to happen that way, and uh, my dad was one that uh, always kind of had a, a short temper. He got flustered real easy, let me put it that way. And I find myself getting flustered real easy sometimes, and I've got to go, Lord, please don't let me turn out that way, amen. And uh, so it's something that I have to work on, but it's something that, that comes natural. But I appreciate him. I also am glad to be a father. I am. I have one son, Ted. And, Ted, would you stand up this morning? I want my boy to stand. And, uh, amen, I appreciate him. And you're going, man, he is really tall. Where did he get his height from? He got his height from my width. So uh, just you can figure that out later, okay? That's the only way I know to tell you that. And, uh, but he's uh, been one of the loves of my life, all of uh, our lives, and, and uh, had a good time coming up and growing up. We, we had a good life together, and uh, I appreciate him. And then he gave me two good grand boys that I love very much also, and I appreciate that. Amen. And we're not going to talk about any of their uh, problems or things they've done in the past. We're going to move on into the sermon. Amen. Because it will make me cry again. Hallelujah. I want, to, I want to spend just a few moments today talking about being a godly dad. And th- this is really important. And, and I hope you'll listen to me for just the next few moments Listen, some of you aren't even fathers yet, but you'll be, you will be one day. It's not just enough to be a dad. You need to become a godly dad. Now, you might think I've blown it. It's too late for that. No, it's not. I don't care how old you are. You can still become a godly father. But if you have young children at home and you have teenagers at home, you need to be a godly dad now. Have you noticed the world we're living in? Have you noticed the craziness that is going on all around us? Have you noticed uh, the left thinking that is taking place and, and everything that is so far from biblical truth that is being uh, spouted on our airwaves right now and, and filtered into the minds of our kids? More than ever before, dads, you need to be a godly dad. And if you're here today and you have young children, you've got a perfect chance to turn it around if you're not being that. You've got a perfect chance to become the godly father that God would have you uh, to be. And so I I want to talk for just a few moments today about being a godly dad and how important it is. Now, in the scripture that I'm going to have you in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, uh, we're going to see here that this is some scripture that the apostle Paul is speaking, and he's speaking to his young spiritual son, Timothy. Timothy was just like a a son to him in the ministry. And so Paul was speaking to him, and Paul was trying to impart some things, good things, into Timothy that could help him in the ministry. Fathers, we have got to impart some good stuff into our kids. We've We've got to build a foundation in their life that is so strong that when you and I are gone, 
And trust me, if this world lingers on, we will leave this earth. But what kind of foundation have you laid in the lives of your kids? And it's so important. So Paul was talking to his spiritual son, and he was desiring to leave Timothy with all that he could to help him become successful, to help him finish the race, to help him to complete the course. So Paul, the spiritual dad, was speaking into the spiritual son's life. And when he did, he really said some good things here that I think we could use as natural dads in raising our kids. Now, in in the scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 10, it says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. He's speaking to Timothy here. Manner of life. He said, You watch me, Timothy. Purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So the spiritual dad didn't hold anything back. He said, hey, look at all this. This is, this, you see my faithfulness. You see how I have lived my life for Christ. You see how I've pushed through, but you've also seen the suffering and the persecution and everything that I've gone through. He said to Timothy, you witnessed my love. You, you witnessed my patience. You witnessed my long suffering. Timothy, firsthand, front, he had a front row seat to Paul's faith and how great a man of God he was. In other words, Paul was the spiritual dad example for Timothy so that he could grow up and be a great man of God himself. Listen, here's what we want for our kids. We want our young men to grow up and be great men of God. We want our young ladies to grow up and be uh, great women of God, don't we? Come on, am I asking the right question today? We want our kids to serve God more than anything else. I'll tell you, if you're here with your parent today and you maybe you're not attending church or going to church, but you're here honoring them today, I want to tell you, I want to say it so they don't have to. Your mom and dad want you to serve God more than anything else on the face of this earth, more than you getting rich, more than you driving fine cars and living in great homes. They want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because that's what they want to leave in your life, which is so important. So the spiritual father here was imparting some things that we can also apply in our lives, dads. Come on, let me preach to dads today, and the moms can just say amen real loud. How about that? That's a pretty good setup. But you need to desire to become a godly dad. And and I don't want you to listen to the devil this morning and tell you you blew it. Come on. Let's get on the right tracks, dad. Let's be the best dad. There's not a dad here today that is perfect. I was thinking earlier, and I didn't write it down or I would have said it, but I was not a perfect father. When when, uh, when, uh, raising Ted, nobody gave me this manual called How to Do Dad. I didn't have that at all. I didn't have anything to go by. I saw my parents, and my parents made a lot of mistakes, and your parents probably made a lot of mistakes, but nobody, John, gave me this manual on how to raise Ted, and I needed a manual on how to raise him. I can tell you that. I needed books upon books, praise God. Love you, son. But it would have been a great help if I'd have had one. But I want, to, I want to share with you some things this morning real quickly that I want you to write down that I think can help you become a godly father or what godly fathers do. Number one, a godly father, ready? Number one, adheres to sound teaching in the word of God. Godly fathers live by this. Godly fathers do not live by what they want to do or what they believe. Godly fathers live by the word of God. I know you're saying that's an iPad. That's not the word of God. It's got plenty of Bibles in it, trust me. But godly fathers adhere to good, scriptural, sound teaching. And they teach that to their kids. And, and, and they preach that to them. And, and, and I don't mean preach in a bad way, but they, they live that before them each and every day, the word of God. I'm going to tell you, you'll never succeed at being a godly father without the word. It's impossible. 
Without sound teaching, without sound doctrine, you have to have it. A father's daily practice ought, ought to match his eternal position in Christ. I like that statement. A father's daily practice ought to match his eternal position in Christ, indicating he has been freed from bondage to sin and can live, now live in a manner pleasing to God. That's how we have to live. And we only do that through basing our life upon the Word of God. Let me tell you that, that the Apostle Paul lived that type of godly life before his spiritual son, Timothy. May I tell you that, that most of the time kids want to be like their dad. Kids want to be like their mom. Kids want to want to want to turn out like them. Why don't that? Why don't you live a life of God? Live a life of the Word before them, so that they become attracted to that. I can tell you, as a young man, my my father didn't go to church most of my life growing up. He would go to church occasionally. He would go with mom probably when she twisted his ear and a, a, a lot or, or or a little bit. But he would go to the house of God or on a special holiday or maybe when they were having a a fried chicken dinner. My dad liked to eat, so he might show up then. I'm being honest with you. And my dad did not start going to church really regularly on his own until after my mother died. But there was that influence there. But my mom left me with the influence of loving God. Now, my father could have did the same thing. My father could have been the priest of the home. He could have been the one that took us to church. He could have been the one that said, hey, let's go into the house of the Lord. He didn't choose to do that. Thank God for my mom in that case. But we need to make sure, dads, that we are adhering to the word of God and leading our family. A godly father also recognizes his conduct is important. Come on now. Fixing to preach right this minute. Dad, your conducts, your con, not conducts, your conduct is important. I can tell you there's things that I probably said or did in front of Ted as he was growing up that I regret doing, that I had to go back and apologize for, that I had to go back and say, hey, dad was wrong for saying that, or dad was wrong for doing that. It's okay to do that, dad. You can do it. But we have to be concerned about our conduct. Because what we do in moderation, our kids will do in excess. Come on, if you can't control your tongue and you're ripping out curse words all the time, let me tell you, your kids are going to curse. They may not be doing it around you right now, but they're doing it at school. Hear what I'm saying? We have to, we have to watch our conduct. We have to watch our temper. We have to watch how we live in front of them because you've got these kids sitting back Wanting to be like their parent. Come on now. Think about that. And so we have to have a godly uh, conduct in front of our kids. And I believe that is something that we need to grab hold of. Also a godly father. i got to move on so I can get them through. A godly father's aim in life is to flee sin and to go after righteousness. Come on now. Your kids need to see you doing this. Come on. There's opportunities for all of us to sin, right? Every age in here, we can sin if we want to. But we better remember, we got people watching us. And dads, we got kids watching us, even grown kids watching us. I can tell you right now, if I did something that wasn't correct, the first one in the crowd to point it out would be my son. He loves me, number one. And he wants me to make right decisions. But we have to realize that, our, that my, my conduct is still important after all these years. Ted has been gone from home for 22 years, 23 years. My conduct is still important in front of him. I'm around the two grand boys quite a bit. My conduct is important in front of them. What we say, what we do, how we act, where we go. Is that what you want your kids doing? Is that how you want them living? Is that how you want them talking? Come on now. So we have to live a conduct that flees sin and goes after righteousness. Righteousness literally means right living. 
Well, pastor, right living is just what you want, right? If it feels good, do it. No, if God's word says it's okay, it's okay. If God's word says it's not, it's not. Because as I said earlier, I believe the whole word of God. And we got to take a stand because let me tell you, our society is slipping off the edge of the cliff. Our kids are in trouble. Their future is in trouble. If we can't give them God, if we can't live a good conduct in front of them and live the way that we should be, we need to be a godly dad. I appreciate our youth pastor. I don't know if he's in here or he went home and slept on the couch. I don't know where he's at. Where you at, Justin? He ain't in here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. His wife's in the back. You can tell him what I said, angel. But he's a good dad. I want to tell you that. I've watched him. Even though he's only been a dad for a few months, he's a good father. He loves little Andy very much and cares for her. And I can tell you, he's going to be a good dad. He's, he is the type of dad that is going to choose not to sin and to follow after righteousness. And you know what? That's going to have a profound effect on Andy as she grows up. And here's what I believe is going to happen to Andy. She'll love God all of her life. She'll love God as she grows up. We already dedicated her to God, but she's going to love the Lord, and, and, and she's going she's to love that because she watched her dad and mom flee sin but pursue a righteous life. Dads, write it down. It's important. Your conduct is so important. Also, a godly father has great faith in God. Great faith in in God. Has, has your children seen your faith in God? No, I'm talking about have they seen your faith in action? Has your family run up against a problem or a difficulty that the whole family, even the kids, knew that there was something going on and something taking place? And have they heard dad say, it's going to be okay because God is in control? It's going to be okay because this is what the Word of God says. This is what the Scripture says. So important. Amen. I've had the privilege of going to, to John and Angie's house. I don't know if John put them up. I think Angie might have did it. But there's Scripture all over their house. The whole Bible is all over their house. Genesis to Revelation. It's there. Close. But they have the Word everywhere. You know what? Those 28 kids they have. Six, one, two, three, six, six. Those six kids that they have, you know what? They see that word. They hear that word. It's, it's, it's important in their home. And let me tell you something. Those kids have been raised up to love God and to serve God. And, and many others are just like that. Your kids are just in love with the Lord. But keep on living that before them. Keep having faith in God and faith in his word. Let me tell you. Dad, our faith is not in our job. Don't teach your kids that. Because somewhere down the road, they'll lose their job. Somewhere down the road, they'll get laid off. Somewhere down the road, the economy will crumble. No, Dad, your faith is not in your job. Your faith is in God. Your faith is not in the provisions that you have. Your faith is in God. Let's teach our kid that. I pray that we taught Ted that growing up. You know, God blessed us. God took care of us all these years. Lenore has always worked outside the home and had great jobs. But I hope Ted learned from us that our faith is not in everything else. Our faith is in the Lord, and we trust God with our entire life. A godly father cares about the example he is setting. Dad, you need to write that one down. You need to be concerned about the example that you're setting. A godly father does well to pay attention to his own example, knowing that his children and others are watching and may follow his lead. They will. They love you. Your kids love you. They adore you. They think you're the, the cream of the crop. They think you're the greatest in the whole world. They think you can beat up every other dad in the neighborhood. And they'll tell people that. They'll get you in a fight. Amen? That's just the way it is. Dad, that, but you've got to be an example. You've got to be a model. You've got to be a role model for them. Let me tell you, we have got to do that, dads. 
And we've got to be a model for Christ for them. Because listen, I don't care if they rise to be the president of the United States or they serve in the Senate or there's some CEO in a corporation. That doesn't really matter. The most important thing is that they know where heaven is at. And they know what it takes to get there. And they have watched you serve the Lord all of their life. And if you're not doing it today, start. It's not too late. I really want that point to drive home today. It's not too late. Even if your kids have grown, you can change your life, change your position as a father and being a godly father. And I still believe you can have some influence on them. Let me give you my last three. A godly father exemplifies patience. Now, some of you said, you just lost me right there. Patience. You know, we have to kind of pray for patience, don't we? And we don't like to pray for patience because when we pray for patience, then we get trials so that our patience can grow. That doesn't sound any fun, does it? But we need patience so that our, we need patience with our kids first off. I mean, you know, your, your kids can try your patience. Kids can push your last button. You know, I'm glad that they don't always have decibel meters going around me. And if you don't know what that is, that's something that measures sound. Because I've been with Drew and Gavin sometimes. And they were only like three feet away. But I was at like 150 decibels. And you probably heard the music at about 80 this morning, so just imagine that. Now, I'm not proud of that, but let me tell you something. We've got to learn patience. That's something I ask God to to help me with. God, help me with my patience. Help me, God, to keep my mouth shut for just a little bit until I cool down and, and think this thing through. Come on now. It's not easy to do. God, give me patience in all areas of my life. When when my kids see that I run into problems or difficulty, let them see me work through it with patience so that they'll learn patience. How many of you know to get through life, you're going to need patience? Your kids are going to grow up. They're going to need to learn patience. Everything doesn't just happen like that. Kids, listen to me. You won't have everything your mom and dad have right now as soon as you get out on your own. If you do, you're in debt and you're in trouble unless it was given to you. So let's pray, God, help me be a godly father that has patience. Help me be a godly father who really loves. And then help me be a godly father, finally, who is steady. Here, one of the biggest problems in American society today, and you hear it on even the secular news all the time, is the absence of of the dad in the home. That is one of the biggest problems in America right now. I wonder why. You know, uh, it's because God designed a home to have a dad and a mom. God designed a family, and whether the mom or the dad is absent, it affects the kids. So dads need to be dads, amen, and they need to be godly fathers, and they need to be steady And consistent. Consistency, we know what that is. You need to be consistent in front of your children. You can't can't have this set of beliefs one day and next week you got a whole new set of beliefs. Your kids won't understand what it means to be stable at all. You can't be on fire for God one week and not serving God the, the next week and living like the devil before that. You cannot do that. A godly dad is stable in front of his children. And let me say it a little further. A godly dad is stable all the time, whether his kids are around or not. May I tell you, the Holy Ghost will help you with that. The Lord will guide you and lead you as you live your life in front of your children. Now listen, John, I'm closing. Nowhere in this message did I say that God expects you to be a perfect dad. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've never met a perfect dad. Dad, I've met some pretty good ones. I've met some guys that I thought were outstanding fathers. I kind of hope that I'm a pretty good father, but I'm not perfect. And I have my downfalls and all. So I, I wasn't preaching perfection to you this morning. I was putting a goal out there this morning that you can go to. Your goal is 
I'm going to do everything I can to be a godly dad. The day's going to come if God tarries that I will pass away from this earth. It's going to happen. Nobody's going to beat that. Nobody has. Even with all the money in the world, they haven't beaten that. You're going to go. Trust me. It's going to happen. And when my funeral happens one day, I know that my son is going to be there. My grandboys are going to be there. And I know they're going to have written beautiful speeches that I have pre-given them. <laughs> Amen. I, I, may, I don't know if I trust them. I may just pre-record it. Amen. And just let you listen to it. But you know what? I've done things with Ted growing up as a kid. I've done things with the grand boys. We do things all the time. But the one thing I want them to be able to say, I don't want them to talk about how many times I took them fishing, how many times I took them to do this or do that. More than anything, guys, and don't say this. If I haven't done it, don't you say it then. More than anything, I want them to be able to say, my dad and my grandpa was a man of God. And he lived God to the best of his ability before me all the days of my life. Oh, I was not perfect. But I want them to be able to say that. I want whoever stands behind the pulpit to do my eulogy to be able to say, he was a man of God. He was a man that stood on God's word, that believed in God's word, that was full of love, that had patience. You know, as I think about that, I got some work to do. I got some areas I need to work on. But it's not too late. I'm only 39 years old. 57. I'm only 57 years old. It's not too late. So I'm going to purpose, Ted, this is my promise to you, son. You're 40 years old now. I'm going to be a better dad to you. To your two boys, I'm going to be a better grandpa because I can get better. I can do some things better than I did. You know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to say, God, Would you forgive me for my failures as a father? And God, would you help me with your Holy Spirit live and be the dad and grandfather that can really impact my boy and my grandboys like never before. Now, here's here's the real kicker. If you or I choose not to be a godly father, if we choose not to serve God or not to serve God with our whole heart, then maybe your children will not serve God at all. And there's something that happens, and we got to take this serious. When they don't serve God at all, when they reject God, they're not going to heaven on your coattail if you make it. They're going to heaven because they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and they're living for God. So, Dad, when, you're, when you hear the preaching this morning on how to be a godly dad, it's not just important it has eternal consequences. That if you're not, it might not just cost you your soul. It could cost their soul. And the soul of your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren. So let's be, let's be a godly dad. You know, preaching this sermon this morning, I wasn't preaching at you. I was preaching with you this morning. Because I am a dad, and I'm proud to be a dad. I am a father, and I want to be a better father than I've ever been. 
So God, help me. And that needs to be the cry of every dad this morning. God, help me. Would you stand with me to your feet today?